I really think this is shaping up to be the year of Idris Elba. Seriously, between a heroic and badass turn as Bloodsport in last year's The Suicide Squad, which actually allowed him to show off his comedic talents, to his voice betrayal of Knuckles in Sonic the Hedgehog 2, which ended up being tough. Tiny Magic Hedgehog destroyed. Yet naive and adorable, which we always kind of want from Knuckles as Sonic fans. You're really heavy! That's because I have one million percent muscle! And his upcoming role as a Jin in George Miller's latest fever dream epic coming out in a few weeks, 3,000 Years of Longing. It seems like Idris Elba is finally getting the star status he deserves. Bringing us to the movie I'm going to talk about today. How the f fuck do I pronounce that? Balthazar Comacoris Beast. Hi everyone, Anthony here from Awesome Anthony Productions, and before I get started, please go ahead and subscribe and be sure to ring the bell so you never miss any of my content. I post new reviews every week along with shorts that I also post to my TikTok and my Instagram. You can find the link for those in the description below. Let's get into it. Beast centers around Dr. Nate Daniels and his daughters, Nora and Meredith. After the loss of the girl's mother, Nate decides to take the girls on a vacation to Africa to meet up with his friend Martin and kind of show the girls the culture that their mother grew up in. This little bump right here, that's you. I still miss her every day. But on a safari ride through a private stretch of land, they find themselves ambushed and attacked by an insanely feral and wounded predator, a bloodthirsty lion who's the only one left from his pride after they were attacked by poachers that's going to stop at nothing to kill them. This leads to an hour and a half of thrills, exciting set pieces, great performances from our leads for the most part, and fantastic cinematography. Even if the film is a little bit predictable, certain areas of the script are lacking, and there are several glaringly dumb decisions that are made by the characters. You're also really gonna need to suspend your disbelief going into this film. But I don't wanna spoil my own damn review here, so the first thing that works is the cast, for the most part. I'll rip the band-aid off right now and see that Nora's actress, Leah Jeffries, is fine, but is nowhere near as good as the rest of the cast. I think this is due to a really strong factor of the film that I'll talk about soon, the long shots. It feels like in many of these scenes, the director allowed the actors to ad-lib to be able to keep the camera rolling, but her lines that she picks just feel awkward and wooden a lot of the time, and her constant screaming and talking throughout every single scene involving the lion got pretty annoying after a while. But outside of the scenes, she held her own pretty well, and when she needed to get pretty dramatic in the beginning before the plot actually kicks off, I thought she was able to bring it, and she did a pretty good job during those scripted scenes. She also plays really well off the rest of the cast in these parts, especially her in-movie sister, Ayanna Holly's Meredith, or Mare as she likes to be called. Hallie and Jeffries bicker and play off each other very naturally, and they actually feel like realistic sisters who love each other but also want to kill each other half the time. There's also Charlotte Copley as Martin, and he's really just a great character with a great presence in this film. Copley's a really strong character actor that kills it in almost every role he's in. Whether he's playing the quiet but reserved hero of District 9, or the insane psychopath with a million different clones that goes on a hyper-violent rampage in almost every scene in Hardcore Henry. You're a fucking rabbit in the headlights, aren't you? Or when it comes to his selfless, kind-hearted, wilderness and wildlife expert Martin in this film. He could have used a bit more in terms of character development and a backstory, but he's an endearing enough character and has incredible chemistry with Idris Elba. And when the shit starts hitting the fan, he plays a pretty vital role in keeping Nate and his family safe. Which, of course, leads me to Idris Elba's role, Nate. It's no secret by this point that Elba is a fantastic actor with plenty of range, from deadpan humor and less subtle outright comedy, to strong dramatic chops and a truly great action presence. This man has been a leading man for years, but Hollywood just hasn't caught up to it yet. But it finally seems like that's turning around. I am aware of the effect I have on Hollywood. Here he's no different, turning in a performance of a realistically pained father and widow that's doing everything he can to keep his family together. It becomes even more realistic when he is forced to play it cool and stay calm during this life-threatening situation and be the father that's completely out of his element but has to do what he needs to do to survive and keep his daughters safe. And Idris Elba really embodies that very well. His character's background as a doctor and a surgeon also adds to the film, making some of the more ridiculous aspects of this a little less silly and giving him more to do than be a badass action hero that runs from one spot to the next trying to avoid the lion. While I'm discussing what works, wow do I have to give it up to the director and the cinematographer. So many of the scenes that involve the family running or hiding from the lion or some other action scene that involves poachers that I won't get too far into because I don't want to spoil anything are done using one take long shots. And that little fact alone goes far in elevating this movie above other typical murderous animal stories. Yeah, some of the shots are digitally stitched together, but this is done so that unless you're looking for it, it's nearly seamless. The camera's always moving too, sticking really close to the characters, which makes for some very claustrophobic shots. During the suspenseful scenes, the fact that the camera is that close takes you right into the character's shoes, with every little sound or ounce of background movement causing your eyes to dart around the screen looking for the lion, while the scenes of the lion actually attacking that utilize these one-shots feel incredibly claustrophobic and are actually 
actually pretty scary due to the mostly great CGI and the fact that the lion looks absolutely massive in some of these low angle shots. While I keep going with the positives, the story, while being just a little bit predictable, is elevated by all the other great and good things in this film. And the added emotion from the story regarding Nate's family and the story of his widow adds another really strong layer to everything, even if it is a bit cliche. I also enjoyed the ending and was surprised by just how heartwarming and uplifting it was, even if the actual climax itself leaves a little bit to be desired in terms of action, payoff, and realism. Now that I've discussed the good, let's get into the not so good. Let's start with the script. Sometimes it feels like the movie had multiple variations of script, each with the same plot points, same outcome, same general plot structure, but that all the dialogue was written by different people and they just mashed it all together. Because some of the lines in this movie are really great. It's the law of the jungle. It's the only law that matters and also really helped by the fact that they're delivered by A-list actors, but some of the lines are really not so great and honestly pretty corny and cheesy and they take you right out of the movie because they're really easy to pick up. And like I said earlier, those long shots felt like the director encouraged the actors to ad-lib a little bit and some can handle that better than others like Charlton Copley or Idris Elba, but the younger actors don't really do that great with it and they tend to get a little repetitive. It's not across the whole movie, but the awkward dialogue comes in enough to where it definitely was noticeable. As were the stupid stupid decisions that were made here and there by the characters. The two daughters are full of them, so don't even get me started on them. It's a little bit forgivable there though because they're kids and they're in a very high stress and scary situation, so you expect them to kind of do those, some dumb things here and there. But occasionally, Nate or Martin or someone who we expect to have more of a head on their shoulders will do something so completely out of left field that makes no sense, seemingly just to get the plot moving. And that also took me out of the movie here and there, as did the CGI. Yes, I know I said it's mostly great, but that's like 80 to 85%. But sometimes the lion goes from looking immaculately constructed, like it just jumped out of the fucking uncanny valley, got an upgrade, and is living with a real pride of lions somewhere, to literally when they cut in the same scene looking like Aslan from the first Narnia movie. Shit, you know what? I take it back. This looks pretty good for 2005 CGI. And it's very noticeable whenever it happens. I almost wish they would have had the Marvel problem where certain scenes look really great and certain scenes themselves don't look so good instead of just having the really great CGI on showcase right next to the crappy CGI because it just makes it very noticeable that you're not looking at a real lion. My last complaint about Beast is one about realism and suspending your disbelief. For a movie that gives so much attention to its characters, their stories, and their relationships to make them feel realistic, this movie really asks a lot of you in the last act. All I'll say, because I don't want to spoil anything, is that there is only so much that a wounded man and a wounded lion can survive. And when you push it past there, it starts to get a little silly. Jesus, did I even like this movie? Look. I didn't go into a movie about Idris Elba fighting a fucking lion expecting the next Citizen Kane. If it were a lesser production with a lesser cast, this could have just been a glorified B-movie at best, and bargain bin trash at worst. But instead, we get an above average thriller with a mostly fantastic cast, surprisingly compelling cinematography, potent emotional beats, mostly strong visual effects, and tension-filled action scenes that are done so well it mostly works at distracting you from the issues that the movie has, like the predictable-ish story, the occasionally so-so effects, the silliness towards the end, the occasional awkward dialogue, and the slight drag and pace in the middle. Maybe don't rush out and pay full price to see it, though I will say that I had a blast watching this in Dolby. If you have A-List or Regal Unlimited, maybe make a reservation, go see it on the biggest screen you can. Otherwise, you can maybe wait for it to hit streaming. Nothing against you, Idris Elba. We need more starring roles for you, and I'm really excited to see you in 3,000 Years of Longing. You'll see. Anyway. That's my review of Beast. If you enjoyed this video or found it helpful, go ahead and leave a like, comment below, and let me know if you saw the movie or what you thought. Then go ahead and subscribe and ring the bell if you haven't done so already. You know what it does. It lets you know whenever I post some new shit. All of this is a virtual sacrifice to the algorithm so that more people can see my channel and I can share my passion with more fantastic people like you. I also post shorts weekly, TikToks, and reels to my Instagram, which you can find the links for in the description below. Lastly, if you're in the mood for some more of my content, you can click or tap here to go to my channel or check out my review of Bullet Train. Thanks for watching, my friends and I'll see you on the next one.